The head of the Roman Catholic Church in Singapore, Archbishop Gregory Young, and nine other representatives of the church, this afternoon met the Prime Minister to discuss the arrest of the Marxist group involved in a clandestine communist network. After the meeting of nearly two hours, the Prime Minister and the Archbishop spoke to reporters, first about documents on the Marxist group. We were all agreed that the documents disclose substantial, perhaps I should uh, use the exact words, uh, uh, that the government had reasons for its action and that they could not dispute the facts. As for the lesser participants or actors in this group of 16, I promise all those interested that they can read the documents in relation to them if they wish. But they are, their involvement is less than that of Vincent Cheng. I think I should leave uh, the Archbishop to put it in his own words, I mean his feeling in his own words, as to the result of the discussions. It was very good of the Prime Minister to call us up for a dialogue. And this is the conclusion we have arrived at the end of the meeting. We are satisfied that the government of Singapore has nothing against the Catholic Church when it detained 10 of our church workers amongst the 16 who were arrested for possible involvement in the clandestine communist network. Now that you've uh, read the statements from the ministry and uh, met officials from the Ministry of uh, Home Affairs, uh, <clears throat> what was it that convinced you? After going through the depositions made, by the person concerned himself. I have no way of disproving his statement. I have no way. That the man himself admitted that he was using the church. All I want to make sure is that there is no conflict between the church and state on this matter. We will always clarify matters before we take any stand or make any uh, practical moves. Having accepted Vincent Cheng's involvement in a clandestine communist network, the Archbishop asked the government to give as much evidence on the other four church workers who were detained with Cheng. The Prime Minister then clarified the government's position on this matter. He said it is not the practice, nor would subversives be allowed to get away by insisting that the government has got to prove everything against them in a court of law or evidence that will stand up to the strict rules of evidence of a court of law. Mr. Lee said, so long as the government knows it's true, so long as there's been no torture, no coercion, no distortion of the truth, that they are satisfied, that they're prepared to act. But they will not act on concocted evidence. On May 21st, 1987, an overnight security sweep in Singapore known as Operation Spectrum arrested 16 individuals accused of being a part of a clandestine Marxist network working to overthrow the government. The operation marked the beginning of a protracted saga lasting over two years that saw a total of 24 individuals, including Catholic church workers, social workers, university students, lawyers, and theater practitioners taken into custody. 
The arrests were made through the powers provided by the Internal Security Act that allows the state to effectively detain a suspect indefinitely with neither an official charge nor a public trial. An inheritance from colonial era legislation, the exercise of such discretionary powers by the state, most prominently used to weed out individuals accused of being pro-communist in the immediate post-independent years, has more recently been justified as a counter-terror instrument. However, the arrests and detentions of 1987, widely seen as the last po politically motivated exercise of the law, has allowed for the continued perception that the law remains as a tool of last resort for crushing dissent and maintaining the dominance of the ruling People's Action Party. As the poet and playwright Alfian Sayat describes, the events of 1987 are an open wound, a little black hole in the history of Singapore. The words speak to a persisting lacuna in our understanding of this historical episode of which the trauma lies not just in the state violence that was performed, but in how little is known about the grounds upon which the claims of a conspiracy were made. To begin, what exactly is a Marxist? This is not a theoretical question, but a question that was no doubt in the minds of many at the time. A newspaper article released days after the arrest describes the Marxists as the new hybrid pro-communist, which when read as such must register as a profound anachronism. Moreover, for all the ink that was spilled in the months following the arrests, the ideological inclinations of the detainees were never conclusively established, with the official accounts often contradicting each other. Yet despite the confusion, the attachment to the signifier Marxist remained to the point that the events of 1987 are remembered today as the Marxist conspiracy. More specifically, in every mention of the words today, what surfaces from memory is not just the signifier itself, but its very appearance upon the numerous reports that fill the national broadsheet. This sense of the mediation of an event usurping the place of the event itself is confirmed by a cursory search of Marxist conspiracy online that unfailingly turns up numerous images of the newspaper reports, where what is often reproduced is the full page upon which these reports appear, preserving the entire layout of text and pictorial elements. Often, the low resolution of these images renders the text, barring the headline bearing the word Marxist, illegible as if what is held up for examination is not what is within the page, but the page itself. Indeed, in recalling the events of 1987, we are continually returned not just to media, but to the very fact of mediation, which in itself frustrates the demand for transparency. For critiques of the government's account, this often becomes the very evidence of the lack of evidence attesting to the claims of a conspiracy. However, as we shall see, sometimes mediation in standing in, in deferring the encounter with the thing itself, can also conjure from its very lack a presence that is exactly to be experienced as transparency's other conspiracy. So let's begin with one such scene of mediation, a televised press conference held on June the 2nd, 1987 called by the then Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew with the attendance of the Roman Catholic Archbishop Gregory Yong. As suggested by various accounts, the Archbishop was hauled into the press conference without prior warning, having just concluded a private meeting with the Prime Minister earlier in the day. Lee had arranged a meeting to brief the church leader on the implication of various church-affiliated organizations in the conspiracy and more importantly, to assure him that it was against particular individuals among their followers, and not the church itself, that the arrests were carried out. But little did the Archbishop knew that he would have to later make an official statement declaring his satisfaction with the official investigation. <laughs> 
Sitting next to Prime Minister as he faced over a dozen journalists and cameramen, the man must have felt literally cornered. What's more, displayed upon the table before the Prime Minister were no less than three thick binders of files that supposedly held the incriminating evidence. Is in the files, or to quote the expression in Latin, whatever is not in the files is not in the world. It is a saying that sums up the centrality of the written deposition to the modern legal apparatus. Of course, files here refer not just to the physical bounded files on the table, but also the central filing cabinet that we call the archive. This is the archive as the sacred site of originality, the self-enclosed world harboring the files that acquire their authenticity by their very emplacement within the archive. The permanence of the archive turns the files into fetish, such that the world, instead of being that which precedes and gives rise to files, becomes that which is found in them. But how did the archive assume such powers of presencing to begin with? The media theorist Colina Weisman suggests that the originality of the archive, in fact, accrues from the file, or more specifically, the act of filing. Bringing us back to the familiar scene of a writing lesson among the Nambiquara tribe from the Amazon, first described by Levi Strauss and later reinterpreted by Derrida in his critique of phonocentrism, Weisman points us to a detail that appears to have eluded both theorists. While both Levi Strauss and Derrida were more invested in how the men, after being given sheets of paper and pencils, started drawing wavy horizontal lines from which they drew different conclusions on whether they were indifferent to writing. Weisman focuses instead on the fact that while most in the tribe soon lost interest in using their tools, it was the chief who continued the exercise. At some point, the chief even started compiling lists comprising of these apparently indecipherable lines and appeared to read off them as he controlled transactions. Seizing on this moment, Weissman argues that the chief here is writing not necessarily to communicate, but rather to administrate, to regulate the transfer of goods, things, and people during the very act of exchange itself. Here, inscription works to mark, above all, an event. Indeed, the mere fact of an, ev of an event occurring, which coincides with the very making of the mark upon the page. In other words, it is an act of filing. To this end, files can be said to preserve in them something of the conditions under which they were produced. They constitute a kind of quasi-oral writing, writing up while writing along. Weissman goes on to describe the development of the file from its earlier manifestation in the imperial edict that had to be delivered by being read aloud, to his later reconfiguration with the rise of the Senate in the form of minutes that could function without an oral supplement. This culminated in the withdrawal of the file from the magistrate's table into an integrated self-referential repository that we know today as the archive. This is why Derrida calls the archive a place of commencement, of originals, for its authority is derived only through an effacement of the commandment or the act of filing that inaugurated the archive to begin with. Cut away from the outside that laid its ground, the archive becomes a shelter unto itself, protecting itself above all from the memory of this original obliteration the setting aside that makes possible the sense of the archive's wholly determined interior. But returning to the scene of the press conference, something about it suggests an archival logic gone awry. For the files you have returned to the table, discharged from the interior of the archive to be exhibited outside. The ejected document removed from the archive that once put it in its place is turned into an object to be scrutinized in itself, 
returned to the table for a new round of adjudication. The archives, the archive, it seems, was now in question. Simply saying that it's in the files was not enough. So in an unexpected reversal, it became up to the files through their very removal from the archive to reinstate the archive to its originary status. Consider how these were files defined above all by their physicality as files, exploiting the double meaning that accrues to the word, referring both to the textual substance of the documents and the palpable material holding them together. Laid open but held at a distance too far for its contents to be examined, it was their tangibility rather than their readability that mattered lending form and aura to the event of the document's release from the archive. Lee himself was clearly more than conscious of this fact, as seen in how early in the conference, right in the middle of the sentence, he stopped to turn to the, to the files before him. Perhaps I should use the exact words, he said, following which commenced more than a few seconds of flipping and fingering through the paper corpus. The momentary silence filled by the crunch of paper fibers. Of the parts of the conference that were televised, this was only the only time that the Prime Minister retrieved a quote from the files. But nonetheless, throughout the event, the files remained open, with the politician's hand ever so often reaching out to them as if to clutch to a bit of their presence. Or it may be more accurate to say that it was his hand that conferred and confirmed the foul's oratic power, seeing how his handling of the fowls asserted that there was something to be handled, emphasizing their solidity, their compactness, and decorum as physical fowls. The intention, it seems, was to reinvest these documents with an authority seen to emanate from the moment of their exit from the archive. The hand of the Prime Minister removed the files from the archive so as to put them back into their place. But the problem with this little exercise in reauthorizing the archive at, a, at the exit was that the man in charge of doing so was the Archon himself, the guardian of the archive whose commandment enabled the things held within it to begin their presencing. His attempt to pass off as appearing after the archive sabotages itself, given especially that during the conference, he gave himself away. This happened when in yet another calculated pause, the prime minister turned to the archbishop and said, perhaps I think I should leave the archbishop to put it in his own words. And so the archbishop spoke in his own words. But the man who had come before him in doing so had inevitably performed his anteriority to the moment of commencement as such, the moment of words spoken in their supposed originality. The unwitting performance exposed the archontic principle, how it was by commandment that the words of the archbishop were left to be. One photograph of the event best dramatizes the perceived insufficiency of Lee's charade in face of the mounting demands for the fowls to prove themselves. As seen in this white shot of the room, on one side sit the men who have just returned from the archives, and on the other, the journalists perking up their ears towards the scene of disclosure as their hands furiously scribbled away. Craning forward with their eyes, ears, and hands coordinated in a performance of simultaneity, the scribes are caught up in their own process of foul creation, writing up as they write along. Their transcribing bodies recall for me the body that takes its place before the camera lucida. The optical device used by artists to facilitate a point-by-point -point transfer of reality onto representation such that there would be no loss of immediacy between inscription and the inscribed, between foul and the world. In leaning towards the scene, these bodies then appear to be demanding that the fouls on the table likewise demonstrate their indexical link to the real.
The demand was for the files to show that they were indeed files. And as it turns out, failing to convince with the mere presence of files on the table, the state decided to answer this demand by a return to orality, by offering a file that literally spoke for itself. This is the opening shot of the televised confession of Vincent Ching, seen in the center, who was alleged to be the local ring leader of the conspiracy. The program, which aired on June the 9th, 1987, took the form of an interview in which four selected journalists, partially seen in this image, took turns to interrogate the detainee. In itself, the form of the televised confession was not new, having been used for as, almost as long as television had been broadcasted in Singapore. However, Ching's interview stood out for its inordinate length and scope. While previous confessions were brief segments embedded within longer news programs, in which detainees often simply recited their written statements already in circulation, this particular interview lasted over an hour as the man elaborated on every node of his supposed network. Furthermore, its broadcast was anticipated days before by the release of excerpts from the interview teasing the scheduled program adding to the sense of an original disclosure that derives from that fear of missing out so tied to television that anyone who doesn't tune in at the same time as the rest of the nation can only experience a profound belatedness. Fortunately, the experiment turned out to be a fiasco for the government. Cheng appeared jittery throughout the interview, with the audience noting how the cornered man often appeared to be pressed by his interviewers to give the so-called right answer. And if the government had intended to imbue a sense of liveness to the pre-recorded interview by way of dramatizing the singularity of its broadcast, their efforts were thwarted by what the audience observed to be the highly mediated quality of the image, with sudden cuts and inconsistent lighting betraying the fact that the program was assembled by stitching together material from separate shoots. Moreover, Cheng himself had devised his own strategy of resistance. Knowing that his voice was no longer under his possession, he performed a secret intervention to ensure that his image, at least, still was. He combed his hair as he had never done before, slick, backwards, or in his own words, like Lee Kuan Yew. <laughs> and indeed, when the interview was broadcast, his friends, at least as, as Ching claims, could hardly recognize him. With the comb in his hand, Ching had managed to perform an inscription by other means, mimetically repeating the image of the man who was none other than the Archon himself, thereby reopening the archive to the memory of the commandment that, or that authorized his very self-presence. So averse was the reaction to this broadcast that Lee Kuan Yew was said to have blown his top. But of course, the prime minister and editorial genius that he was also knew how he could at once exploit and remove the cuts that have been incised into the archive by Cheng's toothed instrument. The solution was cinematic montage. With this, we arrive at what is perhaps the key innovation of the mass mediation of the Marxist conspiracy, tracing the conspiracy, a two-part documentary that features interviews with the detainees together with various visual, audio, and textual files edited together in a tight narrative as conveyed through a voiceover. Its novelty lay in how it was presented not just as a file in itself, but a process of filing, as it cuts briskly from one file to the next, linking up detainee interviews, archival footage, photographs, audio recordings, printed matter, letters, and other documents in a narrative of mediation begetting mediation. <laughs> 
Throughout the narrative, what is emphasized are the moments of acquaintance, instruction, transcription, relay, and exchange that pass between each individual implicated in the network. We learn about how one detainee got to know another and how some particular detainees served as important bridges or contact points between different groups of conspirators. Others were identified as couriers helping to pass along messages. Equally remarkable is how virtually all the individuals in the supposed network were in one way or another producers or distributors of media. They were writers, editors, booksellers, and playwrights, with the documentary often describing the scene of writing or dissemination itself. By this turn, montage becomes a structure not simply to present one file after another, but more importantly, to represent the relations of contact by which one file is produced from the other. From one hand signing off to the next, contiguity passing off for causality. Throughout the film, an actual scene of conspiracy is never presented, disappeared into the cut, as it may seem. But what else is montage but a reinscription of this very lack as presence, seeing how the cut that separates one shot from the next also connects them, demanding that we read across it, delivering ourselves across the threshold of presence. I would go as far as to say that cinematic cutting in this documentary becomes more of a handling or a handing over as literalized by the many hands, anonymous hands, that appear within the frame. Seen, for instance, in shots showing documents being laid upon the table or flipping through the pages. Often the hands enter from the wings of the screen. The physicality of both foul and hand is significant. For through this performance of fouls reaching out to each other by hand, what is asserted is an indexical relationship that comes to connect all the files within the archive, such that the file world reclaims its capacity to stand for the world itself. From one hand to the next, one file filing out of the other. The archive reconstitutes its world onto itself. The PDF is a peculiar file format. Formerly known as the portable document format, one can take the cue from its name to suggest that transferability is its hallmark. But portability as figured here also feels rather anachronistic. Situated within the broader technological medium of the computer, valorized for its powers of hybridization and user control. The PDF, with all its elements firmly set in place, appears clunky and would have no doubt frustrated some of us here with its non-editability. Such is the impression that forms from the very moment of the file's opening, 
as one immediately registers what Lisa Gittleman calls the look of printedness. Truly, any one of the basic facility to create a PDF understands the motivations for doing so. To impart to a given document a finality that can resist the alterations potentially imposed by software environments or human agents through which the document pass. To this end, the format seeming regression to being a simulacrum of the printed page can further be seen as a response to the mounting anxieties over how a file could, by way of its prolonged digital transmission, see its indexical link to the site of authorship entirely severed. But of course, this sense of the PDF's involubility is largely illusory, given the always present risk of corruption or user hacking, not to mention that it is entirely permissible these days to edit a, a PDF. In the absence of, the, of access to the files sequestered in the state archives, I've had to rely on a network of sources, including fellow researchers, former detainees, friends, artists, and ever so often the internet to gather the materials for this lecture. And naturally among them are hundreds of PDFs, compiling mostly scanned documents, including press releases, affidavits, petitions, newsletters, pamphlets, faxes, handwritten diary entries, scribbled minutes, and drawings. So, but suffice to say that in the midst of what can be called my archive fever, I was distracted and consumed by an even greater affliction, media fever. That is, I found myself captivated by the very materiality of the medium through which I received the contents of my research, which extends beyond the scratchy and grainy surfaces of the scanned documents to include their highly tended, carefully cropped appearances as PDFs. I realize that beyond its immediate practicalities, the PDF also possesses an uncanny or reticizing function. Specifically, in the case of the scanned documents I was examining, many of which were fragments taken from storage boxes too scrappy and abandoned to be called archives, what the file format does is that it lends these unorganized matter a provisional sense of boundedness, not unlike the very act of putting things together within a neat folder. The internet today is littered with numerous such PDFs in the midst of circulation. May they be leaked government documents, slides from random classroom presentations, or individual chapters from a book, the titles of which are not indicated. This makes the internet a kind of anti-archive, disposed of the archontic principle that will allow us to ascertain where a document came from and to where it is headed. The document carried by the PDF is an archival orphan. Accordingly, what the file format offers to the dispossessed document is a kind of temporary shelter. It gives it a sense of an interior, the full substance of which remains withdrawn giving us something to hold on to as we persist in our search for the original. Confirming this impression is the little hand that hovers above the page through which we can clutch onto a bit of the document's quasi-presence. In this grasp of the tiny hand, one can read anxiety, one can read power. Thank you. Thank you very much for those fascinating presentations and, and for, for an amazing performance, Rayan. So what we're going to do now is um, do partially a panel discussion and partially also a plenary discussion um, in which we will also invite our two keynote speakers, Nora Taylor and May Adadol Ingoanej, as well as Annie L. Kwan, to contribute to our conversation as well as a plenary wrap up in terms of also what is the connection of this panel to the wider questions that the conference has raised. So just to get the ball rolling, um, 
there's a certain kind of, for me, methodological question that is coming out of the two papers that you gave, Roger and Chong Dai, and which also really is cropping up in uh, Rayan's performance, and that is the question of where does the archive end and where does the artwork begin in some cases? Um, thinking about some of the performance artists' archives who I have worked with, um, quite often I've encountered in their materials like sketchbooks, for example, drawings, records from earlier times, also a lot of writings, which could also constitute artworks in themselves. So I'm thinking of things like the Roberto Chabet archive, which is within the Asia Art Archive, um, the Green Papaya archive in some ways as well, and that of many other artists. So one level of question which I see here is where are the boundaries between the archive material and the artwork? And then on top of that, something that Roger raised, if corporeality and the body is still so important, how do we go about locating that within an archive? So I'll start first because Roger doesn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, for me, the, um, the question depends on what we want to do. Right. Um, and actually, I'll just loop back a little bit. Um, Roger's talk reminded me that I forgot when I was talking about Ho Zuan's The Critical Dictionary of Southeast Asia, that the reason I wanted to talk about it, not so much because um, I want to emphasize the archive, but because it's a performance uh, in terms of talking. It's a project that is about the performance of storytelling and the performance of history. Okay. So for me, um, one of the things I had talked about is how um, you know when we were digitizing the art, the sketchbooks and notebooks, a question that several people had asked me is, is this primary or is this secondary material? And that question actually I think comes out of um, economics. You know, because some institutions, if they acquire it as archival, then um, there's less money involved than if they acquire it as artwork. But then in terms of access to the material, it would be re easier for the researchers in, at that institution to access it if it were archival rather than artwork. Right? And so there's also the institutional parameters, and I'm sure Roger knows exactly what I'm talking about here. Um, so I think it depends on the context, but also if we just take that out, you know, it depends on what you want to do. Um, and so a document, which oftentimes we would classify as archival, but if we're thinking about performance in this more expansive way that I think some of the papers touch on, I mean, I'm trained in cultural studies, and so we can read documents as performative themselves, right? That they're performing a certain discourse, yeah. Um, and so, I think like that question, like there's really no answer, but it just depends on what is your purpose and what is what are you looking for. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's. <clears throat> I think I agree that there's no answer and that, that there's this sort of um, porous relationship between between the two categories that, of course, they're mutually informing. And I think we see it very often in contemporary art, as we've just seen a few minutes ago, that the, the sort of the, the, the process of research, including research in archives, is actually made manifest as the work. And we see that also in the work, I was just chatting with Nora before, we see that also in the work of people like Eric Gatan or Shubhi Rao. So that's one thing. I think another way of thinking about this, this sort of relationship between the art and the archive, um, that question I think has a great deal of urgency um, in an Anglophone setting and perhaps in a European setting, but I think I'll, it would be interesting to perhaps think through this a little bit more um, etymologically through Southeast Asian vernacular languages. So I had the pleasure of working with a bunch of other brilliant people on um, a, a project in southeast of now uh, recently which talked about the kind of connotative, denotative and etymological sort of uh, relationships of the words modern, contemporary and art in uh, 
maybe nine or maybe ten Southeast Asian vernacular languages. And I don't recall in any one of those um, discussions the, the, the relationship between art, the concept of art, in vernacular languages and the concept of archive ever having arisen. And yet, of course, there are words for archive in Southeast Asian vernacular languages. The fact that it didn't come up in that, in that initial research report doesn't mean that there's not a relationship there, but I, nevertheless, I think it's an interesting, it, it raises, raises an interesting question about whether this question is one that um, uh, might be thought through differently if we try and think it through in different languages. I suppose the third thing that I'd want to say, and it relates to Chung Dai's observations about the kind of, the, the sort of, um, for me, quite uh, mechanical institutional sorts of um, uh, factors that decide whether something gets categorized as an artwork or an archive, is that, um, is that if we look beyond contemporary art to modern art, the historiography of modern art in Southeast Asia has, al has uh, to my mind, has always taken the art and the archive as being, being incredibly mutually informing. So you read some of the, the earlier pioneering Anglophone histories of modern art in Southeast Asia, books like Apinan Porcionons is one of the best insights into the, the kind of um, semi-quasi-colonial relations of the Thai court, for example. Um, uh, art historians of, of the modern in Southeast Asia always use art to illuminate the times and use archives of the times that don't necessarily relate directly to art to illuminate that art. So this relationship, this mutual, mutually kind of informing thing is something that's here and not only in contemporary practices and contemporary art discourse, but that I think is uh, innate to the way that many Southeast Asian modern art histories have been talked about. Right. Um, well, I guess I speak as an artist who has who works with archives or has been construed as working with archives because, um, to be honest, sometimes I'm also quite confused by what exactly defines an archive and or you often see, um, let's say, like exhibition texts or catalogs dis describing a particular installation as an archive when very often the first thing that you, the first and the first time you enter the space, you absolutely have no idea how to access this archive. And if we think about an archive as being conditioned upon this moment of access, can that actually be called an archive as such? And I guess there are many, many definitions, but I, I do sense that there is a very kind of looseness, a looseness to which we apply the term, especially in contemporary art discourse, um, which, is, which I'm actually kind of fine with because I think that actually expresses the complexity of the various practices of, let's say, collecting things um, across you know, vast geographical regions. Um, but what it does seem to me is that the, the further the work seems to, or, or the so-called archive um, uh, move is, is distant from this certain ideal, let's say a European ideal of this kind of archive that is in turn premised upon this kind of ideal public sphere, it seems that more and more the archive cannot quite so-called speak for itself and it requires an oral supplement. And I think we, we talked about, I think yesterday, the very good example that Nora brought up was actually Ko Guang Hao. Um, and, and of course, I think there's, there's always been a conversation in Singapore where um, nobody but Ko himself knows the extent of his archive. You know, there, and, and so, the, 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 um, or, or, so the point of entry, you know, there isn't an exact door into this archive to walk through. You, you kind of have to walk through Ko himself. So, it is, so in that sense, it's, it's not you know, this kind of perfect archive that we presume it to be. It always requires uh, the supplementary presence of a live body. And I think, um, and the question is, can there ever be an archive that does not have the supplementary presence? Uh, um, or or if, if, if that whole idea of you know, this perfect archive is just a profound fantasy to begin with. So that very much echoes back to the idea of also a, a a performative enactment, in a way, of the archives, which is what you do, which is what we see, for example, also in the work of Erica Tan, which cropped up in Roger's presentation, Ho Tsun Yin as well, to some extent. Um, going back to the question also that Roger posed during his talk is then thinking about these kinds of activities in the wider con context of Southeast Asian contemporary art. Can we then argue maybe for a certain central position of performativity? both as a strategy of research, maybe, also as a strategy of intermediality. Um, so thinking in a way through the discussions that we've had now around archives, but thinking broader, again, into the context of just contemporary art practices more widely. 
Perhaps that's, that's a question that maybe I, I can also open up to Nora and to May if they have any thoughts on. Thank you. Um, the three were brilliant as usual. Um, I want to, can I take the liberty of um, continuing a little bit on this discussion because uh, Ruyan said something, it's not the content of the page, but the page itself. It also relates to this question of um, form versus content that actually is something that we touched on in many different works, whether there is political content, let's say, in a performance work, whether it's the body as a vessel, and therefore that's sort of the form, and then who performs that content, and what is that content that is presented in that form. So I think that that's uh, you know, something that art historians think about more generally through time to this, this dichotomy that is not really a dichotomy often. It's more like, um, a dialectic uh, situation. So I think that Ruyan pointed to that very, very brilliantly, and especially in this day, uh, in our age, a uh, post uh, media age where the actual form and content are completely intertwined because we screen, uh, we don't have form. It's intangible. So what is the form? It, it only replicates a previous form that was a page on a paper, a uh, paper, uh, sort of piece of paper, I don't know. I mean, that's not a question, it's just kind of a comment. I don't know if May wants to add to that. I'm really, um, okay, this, this, will, this will be um, confused, but I'll try to work it through. Um, following on from Roger's question, um, performativity without the corporeal. So this question is, where does the body go? Um, and then Royan's performance, which strangely makes me think of um, this question of um, enactment of the archive, um, the sort of gestures and processes by which something is indexed, presence um, comes to the archive. Weirdly, it somehow makes me think of this sort of um, uh, processes of sacralization. So maybe this is, this is because I've been having to read essays on Buddhist art. Um, people writing uh, in response to people like Donald Swearer's work on uh, how, how the figure, the sculpture of the Buddha becomes that which acquires presence. It becomes so through ritual forms of sacralization. And somehow the sort of the gestures that your performance make repeatedly. Um, what does the hand do? Where does the body come into the handling of the archive? So I'm wondering whether um, alongside thinking this through um, uh, strategies of reading Derrida questions, conceptualization of archival fe uh, fever, and so on and so forth. Um, is there a route with which we can do this in another way? Via um, processes and rituals of sacralization. That maybe has, again, so so it's, it's, it's back to my, um, my wondering what you can do in relation to uh, theological concepts, relig religious practices, and religious notions that are cited elsewhere. Um, and then I'm thinking, in Roger's presentation, well, where does the body go, actually, if the body is not performing, if performativity is not about the performing of the body? Um, and when you raise the question of the digital, where it goes, it seems to be, then it's a question of labor. What produces um, Sun Yun's work? The sort of uh, labor that's involved in the production of somebody like Kardar's work. Um, 
So it's kind of interesting because when you're talking about the sort of liveness of digitality as that which is uh, what you see, the surface of what you see, you don't see the body, the human body so much, but where the body goes seems to be in, in the laboring of the creation of performativity. What that brings to mind for me, which tries to come come at your question, although I don't, I don't know how well I'll be able to about the, the sort of the corporeal in the archive. I've done a bit of work on this, um, this, this institution called the Buddhist Archive of Photography in Lung Prabang in Laos, um, which comprises, as I said, 35,000 photographs, um, all of which have been digitized, most of which are available for free on your phones through the British Library's Endangered Archives Program website. Two things are interesting for me about that process of digitization and cataloging. One is that the metadata attached to the images is not the kind of metadata you might expect relating to the subject matter of the photographs, the things or people that are depicted, um, the places that they relate to. Instead, the metadata is about which, which monk's cabinet did this come from? Which part of the cabinet? The cabinet in which kuti or, or uh, abode dwelling um, of which monk in which, in which pod Pagoda, uh, when was it collected and under what circumstances? Had it been sealed there um, as was customary when the, the monk would pass away? Had it been sealed there to preserve it from uh, uh, communist surveillance uh, in the aftermath of the 1975 re revolution? Um, uh, or, or for other reasons? The labor, of course, of scanning 35,000 photographs is not insignificant, and it's labor that was carried out not by uh, experts, foreign experts, as the, as the archivists, the, the Laotian and Lao archivists refer to the Europeans of various nationalities who went to uh, formalize this relationship with the British Library. The archiving, the, the, uh, sorry, the, the, the digitizing was done by Laotian Lao um, people, not because they were cheaper and not because they were, um, not because of some sort of uh, uh, bleeding heart uh, desire to capacity build, but rather because they were monks and because it was necessary for this, uh, for this process of digitization to be a pedagogical process, to be a learning process. And the, the, the whole point of doing this for, for the individuals who set up this archive was to continue the work of the great monks who had taken and collected the photographs in the first place from the 1890s onwards. So that labor, um, which that, that, that very mundane, repetitive labor of digitization, which, which, which Rayan brings alive for us in the form of the scanned PDF, right? That labor is so often invisible, and yet in this case it was really central to the conceptual sort of um, making of this digital version of the archive. It's interesting when we were thinking about uh, methodologies, and I brought up hanging out, you know, and there's one methodology, and then there's reading, and there's archiving can be a f method, you know, and so it's interesting because then it, we're, you know, up to the digital. Um, I just think it's interesting that, again, with this question of form and <laughs> content, you know, how are we obtaining these in, this information and whose body are we talking about? Because there's also the researcher, the scholar, whose body is immersed in this material and is obtaining something from that material, too. So. Um, I wanted to follow up on um, May's question uh, with the dictionary, um, where is the body, right? And I think it goes back to Roger's argument you know, that uh, performance is both um, conceptual and corporal. So with the dictionary, it depends on how, uh, on the form in which the dictionary is um, presented or embodied because a zoo has presented it as a projection onto a wall, and so in that sense, it's like a film. Right? Um, but when it's on a computer, it does need the viewer's body because you have mm. to click it, mm. right? And so there is the body, and so I think like that kind of is a perfect mm. illustration of what you were talking mm. about. That is yeah. both, um, and yes, there is the labor. Uh, I mean, it was an intense project. And there can always be more labor put into it. And I think for me, actually, that's why the later iterations that I've seen, um, 
um, I can't really describe it because I saw it when he was just making it and you could see that it wasn't really hanging together. But now, I think because he's been able to fine tune the annotation of the clips themselves and there has been time to upload so many clips that it is a much, uh, it's a richer repository um, than it was when we first started that project. Uh, and actually, I want to get back to your question about um, performativity or performance, right? Um, I think one of the things um, that I actually wanted to um, argue is um, that a lot of these works are, um, they cross genres and disciplines, yeah. In the same way that I think in the academy, we we have to be slotted into certain fields or certain departments. Um, I think that's more, again, the economics of the institution. And the analogy I would make with art production is that artists aren't necessarily just performance artists or painters you know, or sculptors, but in a lot of these works, like Lee Wen, for example, a lot. Um, a lot of the performances, if not all of them, include um, objects that he created, you know, sculpture, right? Uh, included lyrics that he wrote. Um, he had paintings, you know, on the walls, you know, but it's be he's known publicly mostly as a performance artist, but he actually was quite uh, multidisciplinary. Um, yeah, maybe to just uh, add on to that, and also to go back to kind of Nora's observation on the page, and also to May's um, kind of extrapolation from Derrida. There was actually a comment that I, I remember actually a few years ago. Um, it was at the, on the occasion, I think it was like of a conference when they were moving Derrida's library, was it to Yale or something? And, and there was a comment made in the conference that said that the moment of op the opening of Derrida's library is actually the moment where we stop reading and we start noticing the marks on the page instead. You know, we want to see, did Derrida really read all the volumes of marks? You know, how, how are the pages fresh or whatever? So, I mean, like, I'm always very fascinated by this moment where you stop actually reading but and turn to the materiality of the thing itself. And that was something that I encountered when I was actually looking at a lot of these televised interviews that, that I was collecting. I was actually trying to collect more the reviews and how people were watching these confessions. And it was a very strange mode of spectatorship because people were waiting to see like a, a sudden cut or an abrupt cut. Like, so you're not, you're not seeing the film itself, you're seeing the cutting of the film. Um, and so they, there's even this rumor that persists today that Lee Kuan Yew was personally at the editing desk. So it's a very powerful conjuring of the body of a man, you know, by way of a kind of these kind of acts of uh, negation, in fact. Um, and sometimes these can come out accidentally. And, and the question is, you know, whether if, if we move towards, you know, in the kind of more digital age, you know, where things are becoming, it's so easy to make a kind of super slick videos these days, you know, the, these moments of tension between the material and the content, would it be lost? Um, and there's actually also one more example that I didn't m manage to bring into this. It's, it's was, um, there was this, because this particular televised interview that was made, I think, in the 1970s, the late 1970s. And this was of a, quite a prominent uh, a public figure, Ho Kwon Pin in Singapore. And that television interview took place exactly at the same moment that color television was first broadcast in Singapore. And unfortunately, Ho Kwon Ping was wearing this, you know, weird striped or whatever shirt, and his shirt just flared up. And then that was the quote from the newspaper article. The word, his, his shirt was dazzling. So like, no one was actually watching the, listening to the confession. They were looking at these dazzling shirts. Um, and of course, that also happened in a time where, you know, you have this particular technology and the way that technology rubs against content, produces all kinds of fiction, and you have artifacts, and people start to read into these artifacts. Um, and of course, the question is, you know, whether if we are moving towards, you know, this kind of pure digitization, if, if that is going to be lost somehow. And I feel like, in a way, Zunian's project is, is in a way trying to reintroduce this kind of contingency of the material, even though it happens in a, you know, takes place through this high technological form, yeah. Um, I just wanted to pick up on what May was talking about. 
and also like having sort of been thinking about archives for a while and I was wondering whether that pathway that May was opening kind of can lead us away from thinking of the archive with reference to Derrida and the Akion, you know, the father's narrative and what is then suppressed, therefore what is, what is allowed to be in it, what's suppressed, a kind of more traditional sort of Freudian reading of the archive. And I wonder whether that shift allows a different kind of ontological mapping of the archive into using a different cosmology um, and there's a lot of talk about presence, embodiment, absence, and it makes me think of like the concepts of anaconic, you know, where how in the sort of Buddhist uh, cosmology, you know, the original Buddha was so sacred you couldn't portray his visage, you know, you could only indicate that the presence of the Buddha was there. So, you know, going back to first century, the Sanchi Stupa, you have like little footsteps that indicate, the, you know, the, the path of the Buddha or the horse, but never, never showing the Buddha. But yet, everyone recognized those emblems as being that is the presence of the Buddha. And I also think about um, Joanna Wolfhoff's uh, research on thinking about the concepts of dashan, you know, and how, you know, is that process of the pilgrimage and the, the person going to the, the sacred site and then locking eyes with, you know, the image as in the statuary and that moment something comes alive and how she's using that model to think about how we read um, photography specifically photography of, I think, the Bayon temples that she was researching. So I kind of think of how this sort of maps it in a different way, the way the archive could be perceived. And even then, I mean, and this is a stretch that I've, I'm, I will need to work through more, but how, um, in the sense of, you know, when we think about Theravada and then the Mahayana Buddhism, how, you know, the stupa sort of stands in for the body of the Buddha, and every stupa is supposedly to hold a real relic of the Buddha, even though physically that's an impossibility. But yet these stupas magically sort of multiply, multiply. And there's something about thinking about the original artifact and then the replication of that through the image and that circulation to the digital realm. And a lot of these, you know, even go down to what people bring as tributes, the little votive. Uh, aspect, you know, I'm going to build a little stupor to pay tribute to the big stupor and I leave it around the stupor and so then suddenly the stupor continues to manifest. But many of these actions of duplication also keep indicating to us a sort of futuring of something, you know, because the entire Buddhist cosmology is about the, the yet to come, you know, and so therefore that makes me then wonder whether that is a kind of important shift in how we perceive the archive as not just a repository of things that has happened already, but something that could be indicative of what is to come, which is uh, you know, activated by the next person using the archive, the next moment of that shout out. So I'm just wondering about that. Hearing, hearing your reference to anachronism is, is really exciting. Uh, this is also a I think I like to think about the relationship between the anaconic and perhaps the abstract is the most obvious sort of line of inquiry. But um, um, I, I like to think, to, to, I'd like to listen to Ashley Thompson sort of talking about the possibilities of the anaconic as a mode of interpretation. And at a recent talk she gave in Singapore, she um, described the Buddha as trans. The Buddha is, of course, a man, but also not a man, in the same way that monks have been described by uh, other scholars of Theravadan Buddhism as being both men and, and not men and, and trans. So perhaps to go back to this art archive question, perhaps one difference is that an archive is usually gendered and usually masculine because it's usually got Lee Kuan Yew either really or, or perhaps imaginatively standing there at the editing table, right? Whereas an, an artwork is usually and perhaps always necessarily trans, perhaps. And, and an iconic representation of the Buddha, if the Buddha is already trans, but yet his, 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 his body is not being represented it's be because it's an anaconic trace of a footstep or, or some other relic, then the, the anaconic representation of the trans not male figure is even more trans than not male, right? Ashley would say trans rather than asexual because asexual implies that the sexual is is a thing that is not there, whereas the trans implies that the sexual is a thing that is there in many and, and, and in many ways that are always between and across and, and, and exceeding 
rather than that it's asexual, which is that, that it's been right. stripped away, taken away. Trans also implies from one to another, though. Neither from one to another, but between, always between one and another, okay. and therefore both one and the other. Okay. Perhaps. Rayan, I was wondering whether you could maybe relate that to your artistic, your artistic approach in a way, uh, because you, you are both the investigator of the archives, and at the same time you are also the producer of a new form of, of knowledge and presentation here. So you you both excavate, but you produce at the same time. So in a way, you 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 embody something that that is on on both sides. What what Roger is, I think, trying to hint towards, um, in which we saw in some of the other works as well. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about about your artistic process in that sense? Um, like I mean, as, as I mentioned just now, so like um, I've always been more interested in, in looking at these images from really their material base, and sometimes in a way that is almost completely banal and. And I guess this is a set of material that I've worked in and also different other works. And, and so it's something that I've been going back to from time to time again. And, and it's always the, the, the thing sometimes in, 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 in the background of an image, or sometimes that is even in the corner of the image, that, that fascinates me more than, than what is the, 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 the central figure, so to speak. Um, but at the same time, you know, this is, it's, because this is also a very sensitive historical episode in, in Singapore. And and sometimes to do this kind of research or to be a bit of a obsessive regarding questions of mediums and materiality is to really go against the grain of a, a dominant so-called counter discourse already to so insofar as the dominant is that of the state that is, is really a demand for transparency, you know, which is and, and very often that mode of discourse is almost because I mean the past two days we so much of the time we've been talking about loss and the inability to recuperate. But sometimes when you bring that set of discussions to say um, a, a historian who is um, um, uh, working in social history and, and especially coming from a more activist perspective, um, the kind of discussions that we have can be rather quaint. Um, and, and that has always been a bit of a problem that I have working with this material because very often um, um, the demand when you work, when you're addressing this episode is, is the demand for the files itself. So really of that of, you know, what exactly were the files that Lee Kuan Yew were holding in his hand? We want to see that. Um, um, but I think for me the question is always, um, like, like it's not that I'm I kind of opposed to this kind of demand of access to the files or, or demand for, for transparency, but the question is, if indeed the files are open and indeed you can read every single line in the files, does it mean that the loss is fully recuperated? And I think that for me is always a certain, at least coming from a kind of artistic perspective or an aesthetics perspective, that is always the question, you know, is there, um, um, and I think this also comes at a moment that, that for instance, um, um, there are a lot of kind of opening of these kind of, uh, um, well, at least certain documents, especially in, in England, have would, would pass a particular date and now there are a lot of, um, new documents released from colonial Singapore in the 50s, and that was an extremely contested moment. So these are the moments where, where you, know, you have historians in Singapore who are basically waiting for files to be released so that they can, in a way, get the proverbial smoking gun. Um, and, and yeah, so whenever that happens, you know, there's a whole flurry of, of, of discourse centered around it. But um, yeah, but I'm always intended to, to you know, kind of push that dis discussion forward even more and in, in really questioning you know exactly where are the limits of transparency and 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 and, and yeah how those limits actually define um, the thing that we are so-called looking for yeah that also that for me also offers a certain provocation um, you just said and what was it it's it's going against the state um, and for me, that brings me back to this question of, of national art histories and, mm. and in a way how I personally feel that performative strategies quite often also go against the grain of national art histories. And I asked this question to May as well this morning about what her methodology and how her methodology also helps us to think beyond the nation in Southeast Asia, which is such a predominant uh, way of still talking about these issues. I mean, you are talking about Singapore and Singaporean mm. history in this case. We go back quite often to, to, to these national art histories. Um, 
so I find it really interesting that you talk about this notion of loss and recuperation. And it gets me thinking also about uh, Anita's talk earlier today, which in a sense is also a personal act of archiving your, the history of your performances and what the loss actually means in each one of those stages. And what Anita, you've been talking about is also how that is not just about a Cambodian history, it is not just about an American history, it is a history that is hybrid for you as, as somebody of both Thai and Cambodian of, of that middle ground, but also of the diasporic ground that you embody. Um, so there is a certain also interconnection about the artist's own personal archive in the making, which then Chung Dai for, for you brings a big task then for gathering those archives in a way and, and looping them back into the writing of history. Mm. 